In this video, we're going to look at the angular momentum of molecular orbitals when we have some diatomic molecule and see how this gives us some uh, descriptions which we can apply to the uh, shapes of molecular orbitals and classify them. And there are going to be some terms that we are uh, very familiar with from general chemistry and also organic chemistry. Okay, so we've got two nuclei here in our diatomic molecule. We've got nucleus A, nucleus B. They each have a charge of ZA plus and then ZB plus, with ZA and ZB being the integer number of protons they each have in atomic units. And then two points are going to be connected by a line, so that's our internuclear axis here. This dotted purple line is going to be our uh, line that connects these two nuclei, and it's also going to be our Z axis uh, for all of these systems that we have down here. So what we're interested in is this operator LZ, the Z component of angular momentum, the angular momentum around this Z axis for whatever orbitals we have. And if you write down the explicit form of LZ and the explicit form of the Hamiltonian for any uh, diatomic molecule, you'll find that the, they commute with each other, that LZ and H commute. So that means that they have a common set of eigenfunctions according to what we saw very uh, long ago about uh, commuting operators. And we know that these uh, atomic orbitals here f overlapping to form our molecular orbitals, and those molecular orbitals are the eigenfunctions of our Hamiltonian, or whatever approximate Hamiltonian we've defined. So they're eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian, therefore they're also eigenfunctions of LZ. So our molecular orbitals that we're going to have are going to be eigenfunctions of LZ. So they're going to obey an eigenvalue equation where if we have LZ acting on psi, the ith molecular orbital, then we get the, we get the eigenvalue h bar m sub i times psi, times psi i back. So our eigenvalue is h bar m sub i. And we have this uh, angular momentum quantum number m here, the quantum number around the z axis. And this can take on integer values, uh, positive or negative. It can be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc. And if we actually look at what the value of these are, of this eigenvalue m, and then we classify that based off of the type of state which that represents, we're going to get some familiar terms that we've seen before. So simplest case, we have m equals 0. That's going to be called a sigma orbital, which forms sigma bonds and also sigma antibonds. If we have m equals 1, well, I guess I should say absolute value of m here we're concerned with. If m equals 1, then that would be called a pi orbital, uh, also forms pi bonds and pi antibonds. So we're very familiar with terms like sigma bond and pi bond from general chemistry and organic chemistry. But you can actually generalize this and go beyond that. You can have m equals 2 and form what we would call a delta bond. If you're generally doesn't occur unless you're deeper in the periodic table than we generally do in organic chemistry, but certainly possible. And it's also conceptually possible to have phi bonds and then et cetera beyond that. So you'll notice that these Greek letters here have the same letter as uh, the values of uh, orbital angular momentum for atomic orbitals. So an S orbitals can form sigma bonds, P orbitals can form pi bonds, again starting with the same letter, letter. D orbitals can form delta bonds, but as we'll see, uh, P orbitals can form pi bonds or sigma bonds, and overlapping D orbitals can form uh, delta bonds, pi bonds, and sigma bonds. Okay, so let's do some examples and kind of make this concrete about what this means for how we look at these states here. Okay, so I've got this axis down here, and this is going to be my internuclear axis down here, my two nuclei in yellow. And then I'm going to take two different types of orbitals and overlap them and then see what type of value for m we get and what type of uh, state that would form, what type of bond or antibond we would get from that orbital. Okay, so we're going to do, for example, a 1s orbital here. We're going to look at, say, 2px, 2px or 2py, depending on which one you want to want, look at it as here, 2pz. 
And then we're also going to look at uh, some d orbitals. Look at, for example, 3dxy or 3d, sorry, 3dxz or 3d yz and then 3dz squared 3d xy and 3d x squared minus y squared okay so we have first here we're looking at the 1s so in green here we have a spherical orbital there spherical orbital there they're both positive all the way through only one phase uh, it doesn't switch signs anywhere. It's just an isotropic sphere in terms of its angular part. So if we flip this down and we look down the nuclear axis, look down the axis where these two nuclei are directly behind each other, we'll see something which looks like this. And it doesn't change with respect to angle. It's going around here. I get a positive phase all the way around. So this is indicative of having a value of m equals zero. And so overlapping s orbitals form a sigma bond or sigma antibonds. This would be a sigma bond in this case because they positively overlap. Okay, and then if we look at 2px or 2py, they're going to be out of the plane here, away from the axis. I have them um, positive on this side, negative on this side. Positive up here, negative down there. They overlap. Uh, constructively at the top there, the way that I've drawn them. And if we turn this and we look down the axis, what we'll see is this lobe up here and then a negative lobe down there. So what we have here is m equals 1, which according to our chart means that this is a pi orbital. So this would form a pi bond or a pi antibond if it was the opposite uh, combination. And these are both consistent with what we expect, uh, sigma bonds being straight on overlap of orbitals, pi bonds being side on overlap of things like p orbitals. Okay, we've all seen that before, that's all perfectly fine. Uh, but we can also arrange p orbitals in a different way. We could arrange p orbitals such that they lie on the internuclear axis like the pz orbital does. And then if I have positive ends pointing towards the middle, negative ends pointing towards the outside. If I look down this axis, the only thing I'm going to see is circular density. I hit this first negative lobe here, and then everything else is hidden behind it. So with respect to this angle here, I have a uh, negative value all the way around as I first hit uh, this orbital here. So this is actually a value of m, which is equal to 0. So this is two p orbitals overlapping head on, and they are forming a sigma orbital. And this overlap here would be a sigma bond. OK, now on to d orbitals to really flesh this out, give us some more examples, and help us to uh, drive the concept home here. OK, so let's say we have two of our lobes going, perpend going in the plane here, perpendicular to our axis and two perpendicular going in and out of the plane of the screen there. So let's say our positive lobes are the ones which are in the screen, in the plane of the screen. Our negative lobes are outside. So these four sets of lobes which I've drawn connecting lines to are overlapping constructively. And if we look down this axis, we'll see something like this. We'll see what looks like a single d orbital. I go from positive to negative, back to positive, back to negative, back to positive. So I change from negative to positive twice on one trip around. And these I change zero times, m equals zero, zero times, m equals zero. Now here I go negative, positive, negative, m equals one. I switch back and forth once. Here I go negative, positive, negative, positive on one trip around. So this is a case where m equals 2, and this side on overlap of d orbitals would actually be a delta bond. OK, then we can have other types of p d orbitals here, which would be we have one lobe, which is perpendicular to our internuclear axis out of the plane, 
one lobe in the plane. Um, I think I actually switched up these labels here, but that's okay. Just uh, across those up there. I think these two belong down there. Those two belong up there. Just do the little switcheroo in your mind there. But that's not the point. The point is really the example for what these shapes look like. Let's say the positive lobes are in the plane and the negative lobes are perpendicular to the internuclear axis there. Okay, now what do we see if we look down this axis? Uh, well, we'll see we've got the negative lobes there and we got the positive lobes on the inside which are overlapping like that. So if we, if we go all the way around here we'll see we got these one, we got this one lobe sticking out here so just like a p orbital where we have one lobe as we go all the way across and around here uh, we're going to switch uh, our values here one time going around so this is actually m equals one and this would be a pi type state then the final case we'd have the three dz squared orbital where we have two lobes along the internuclear axis and then there's kind of this donut of charge going around the axis as well. Let me call the lobes in the axis positive and I'll call that donut going around it negative. That kind of cylindrical donut going around. Alright, so if we look down this axis we'll see the two lobes being positive there and the donut is negative and kind of goes around the outside of it. So if you pick a, any value of R away from the axis and you go around it's all negative all the way around here. It doesn't change sign there. It doesn't uh, decay away. And if I go on the inside it's all positive. It doesn't change sign there. So this head-on overlap of these d orbitals like this is actually m equals zero and this would be two d orbitals in fact forming a sigma orbital and a sigma bond. So uh, this is a little bit of a extension of the general type of intuition you have from general chemistry about how s orbitals and p orbitals and now even d orbitals can form sigma and pi bonds and this is the generalization of that and the kind of mathematical origin for where those types of terms that you're familiar with come from.